to Selena Sagan, who did her um, undergraduate studies at McGill, um, and then did a post, a PhD rather, in biochemistry, microbiology, immunology. I'm not sure. I guess it's a mixed uh, program there in the, in Ottawa. And then uh, she went to warmer climates to do a, her postdoc at Stanford, just a little bit south of here. Um, and then was recruited, or actually ended up back at McGill because she missed the snow. And um, she continued on to do a postdoc, but then she rose through the ranks very quickly there in microbiology, immunology, biochemistry, um, and did all kinds of uh, amazing things actually in a very topical area these days, RNA. Um, and, um, and somehow or other, um, microbiology, immunology managed to recruit her to Vancouver, uh, remarkably at, the, uh, at a, a stage in her career where we don't often get such um, wonderful opportunities and wonderful people here um, at that stage. Um, and uh, she came here having had a Canada Research Chair and uh, multiple awards, but she moved some of those awards here um, and just arrived in July um, in these wonderfully warm, dry climates, just like California. So her particular interest, as I said, is in RNA. She's won multiple awards and prizes. She has a fantastic um, CV, which is really nice to see that her CV is including a bunch of students that she supported and trained, which reflects um, her skills, not only in research, but in teaching. So we're really happy to have her here to speak today. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much for the kind invitation to speak. I'm really excited to sort of share my research with you and, and hopefully to get to know you all um, since I just moved here in July. My lab is located in 4E in the LSI. And so please say hello. Um, if you pass me in the hall, I'm trying to get to know all of my neighbors. So today I'm going to tell you about um, a, a research program that we've been sort of working on for about 10 years um, in the Sagan lab. Um, and have sort of moved here to UBC. So um, in the Sagan lab, um, I like to say that we don't discriminate. We like RNAs, whether they're big or small. And so one of the RNAs that we're interested in is microRNAs. Now microRNAs are small non-coding RNAs. Uh, they're typically 21 to 25 nucleotides in length. Um, they're usually highly evolutionarily conserved and they mediate post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression, typically through base pairing interactions with the seed region of the microRNA, which is nucleotides two through eight. And through this activity, they're actually predicted to regulate about 60% of all human genes. And they're thus implicated in numerous diseases, including cancer, viral infections, cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. And this is just a brief schematic of the microRNA pathway, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So microRNAs typically are transcribed as um, highly structured primary microRNAs. Um, they're exported to the nucleus as a precursor microRNA, about 70 nucleotide hairpin, and then are further processed by a dicer enzyme into a microRNA duplex. And then one arm of that duplex is taken up into the RNA-induced silencing complex, which includes an argonaut protein, and then this uh, strand of the microRNA, the mature microRNA is then used to target um, complementary messenger RNAs. And when uh, microRNAs bind to their target RNAs, if there's complete binding, then they mediate target cleavage. Um, but if there's partial binding, then typically they are involved in translational inhibition or acceler accelerated adenylation. And this is through recruitment of the microRNA silencing effector protein called TNRC6. And we'll come back to TNRC6 in my talk. And so microRNAs typically downregulate gene expression, but today I'm gonna to tell you about a really non-canonical microRNA target RNA interaction, which is between a microRNA and hepatitis C virus. So the microRNA that we're particularly interested in is called microRNA-122. And microRNA-122 is a highly uh, evolutionarily conserved liver specific microRNA. So you can see even in the zebra fish, if you stain with microRNA-122, you get the liver is chocked full of microRNA-122. And if you see on this Northern blot, um, the human and rat liver are really full of microRNA-122. It actually constitutes 70% of all the microRNAs in the liver. And that means there's about 135,000 copies per cell. So it's a super, super highly abundant microRNA. And the normal role of this microRNA in our bodies is to regulate cholesterol biosynthesis and fatty acid metabolism. All right. So the other RNA that we're interested in uh, for the purposes of this talk is a large RNA. It's the hepatitis C virus RNA. 
And hepatitis C virus is a positive sense RNA virus. It affects about 71 million people worldwide and is responsible for 40 to 60% of chronic liver disease. It's the leading cause of liver transplant worldwide. Um, it's primarily transmitted through blood products. Um, and today most people get infected through uh, intravenous drug use, but we, um, con uh, through contaminated blood, a lot of Canadians got um, infected with hep C through blood transfusion. And of those infected, um, about 85% will become chronically infected. And what that means is they won't actually ever clear the infection. They'll have the infection for life unless uh, we have some kind of antiviral intervention. And today we actually have very, very good drugs or direct acting antivirals, which can cure the majority of HCV infected patients. However, access is a really big issue around the globe. And there's no vaccine available to date for hepatitis C virus. All right. So just briefly, just so that we're all on the same page of what an, a viral life cycle is. So HCV enters cells through receptor mediated endocytosis, and then is uncoded in the, at the endosome to release the positive strand RNA into the cytoplasm. And that positive strand RNA um, is ribosome ready. So it can immediately be translated into the viral polyprotein. And hepatitis C virus, it makes one long polyprotein, about 3000 amino acids. And then it uses host and viral enzymes to cleave that uh, polyprotein up into the 10 mature viral proteins. And when enough of the viral proteins have accumulated, they can then uh, be replicated and uh, replication proceeds through a negative strand intermediate. So the positive strand makes one negative strand, and then that double strand RNA molecule is made into more positive strands. And this is an asymmetric process, so that for every one negative strand, you typically have a ratio of 50 to one positive strands to negative strands in the cell. And then as new positive strands are made, they can either go back and be translated to make more viral proteins, or they can be assembled into viral particles, which are transported and released from the cell to go on to seed a new infection. All right, so hepatitis C virus, um, this is the viral genome and, and the viral polyprotein I'm showing you. And it has highly structured five prime and three prime UTRs. And these are important for different stages of the viral life cycle. So the ones that I've circled here for you are important for viral replication and assembly of viral particles. And uh, this one here that I've circled is important for translation. So hepatitis C virus doesn't have a cap. Um, so it actually has an internal ribosomal entry site, and this is an RNA structure which helps recruit the ribosome independently of having a cap at the five prime terminus of the genome. And interestingly, HCV has a genetic interaction with this small microRNA from our livers called microRNA-122. And this is really unusual because of, for three reasons. So first, microRNAs normally bind to their target RNAs in the three prime UTR, and this one is binding in the five prime UTR. It's actually binding to the very five prime terminus of the genome. This is actually the terminal base I'm showing you here at the five prime end of the viral RNA. The second reason it's unusual is because there's two microRNA-122 sites in very close proximity. So you can see they're actually only separated by a single base on the viral genome. And the third and probably the most unusual thing about this interaction is that microRNA-122 doesn't downregulate gene expression, it actually upregulates hepatitis C virus in our liver. And you can see that really nicely on this northern blot where if you sequester the microRNA using an antisense locked nucleic acid, um, you actually lose HCV RNA accumulation in uh, cell culture. And this isn't just true in cell culture, it's also true in human hepatitis C virus patients. So uh, this is from a clinical trial. Uh, there were two clinical trials with um, antisense microRNA-122 inhibitors. This is from the RG101 trial, where they treated patients with a single dose of an antisense molecule to this human microRNA. And you can see that there were dose-dependent and sustained reductions in HCV RNA accumulation. Two patients were actually cured from hep C just from this single dose of an antisense microRNA-122 inhibitor. So the question that I really started my research lab uh, on back in 2013 was sort of how does microRNA-122 promote HCV RNA accumulation? And we've been working on that ever since. 
So um, when I started the lab, what we knew was that the microRNA bound to the very five prime terminus of the viral genome. So we started to wonder if maybe microRNA 122 could protect the HCV genome from degradation in the cell. And the main uh, five prime uh, exonuclease in our cells is called XRN1. And so uh, my early PhD students, Annie and Jasmine, um, they decided to um, test whether uh, microRNA 122 could prevent uh, decay of the viral RNA. So they did this very simple in vitro assay where they took the end of the viral genome and they incubated it um, with XRN1, uh, either with a control microRNA or with microRNA 122. And you can see that when microRNA 122 is found, it prevents the decay of the five prime terminus of the viral genome. However, when uh, we knocked down XRN1, we saw that there wasn't like really a significant effect on viral RNA accumulation in cells. And so here I'm showing you um, the system that we use to study hepatitis C virus. So it's basically a full length of the hepatitis C virus genome, but it has an insertion of a luciferase gene in the middle. And so we can monitor HCV RNA accumulation using uh, light. And so when we did a knockdown of XRN1 uh, with wild type HCV RNA, when you knock down XRN1, you really didn't see any difference in HCV RNA accumulation but you do see a little bit of a delay in decay. So if you use a genome that has a mutation in the polymerase active site, so the RNA can't be replicated, it can enter the cell and it can make proteins, um, but it can't replicate. So it eventually decays over time. And you can see when you knock down XRN1, you sort of slightly stabilize the viral RNA um, when it can't replicate. But in the presence of wild type um, viral RNA, we actually don't see that there's a significant difference when you knock down XRN1. And so this was sort of the prevailing model at the time uh, was that microRNA 122 binding to the HCV genome would prevent uh, exoribonucleases like XRN1 or XRN2 from um, attacking the viral RNA such that when the viral uh, microRNA wasn't there, the uh, exonucleases could maybe degrade the viral genome. However, what we noticed was there was a little bit of a problem with this model, and that's because the terminus of the genome is thought to be a triphosphate or a fad molecule, not a monophosphate, which would be a substrate for XRN1. And so we thought that perhaps there, we were missing a step here and perhaps the microRNA was protecting against something else. Um, and so we thought that maybe we should look at pyrophosphatases, which are the enzymes which remove a triphosphate, leaving a monophosphate, which is a substrate for these exonucleases in our cells. So Annie from my lab, um, my first PhD student, she looked into the different cellular pyrophosphatases that exist in human cells. And we found that there were really two pyrophosphatases, one called DUSP11 and one called DOM3C. So DUSP11 is a dual specificity phosphatase, so it can remove dye or triphosphates, leaving a monophosphate. And it's involved in turnover of ribosomal RNAs and non-coding RNAs, um, typically pull one or pull three transcripts in our cells. And DOM3Z, also known as DXO or decapping exonuclease, has pyrophosphatase, decapping, and five prime to three prime exoribonuclease activities. And it's typically involved in mRNA capping quality control in our cells. So sometimes the capping reaction doesn't go to completion. And when that happens, um, this enzyme is responsible for uh, cleaning those up. And so the next thing we did was Annie knocked down uh, DOM3Z and DUSP11. And now we started to see that there was like a little bit of an effect on viral RNA accumulation under the wild type conditions. And just like when we knocked down the exoribonuclease, we also saw that um, decay of the RNA was a little bit slower. And so this was our new model. We thought, okay, DUSP11 is what, DUSP11 and DOM3Z is what the microRNA is protecting against, such that when the microRNA is not there, you can remove the pyrophosphate, and then the exoribonuclease can decay the viral RNA. So we thought, great, we're just gonna knock down all these enzymes, right? We're gonna knock down the exonuclease, we're gonna knock down the pyrophosphatases, and then we're not gonna need microRNA 122 at all for HCV RNA accumulation. So that's what we did. And when we did this in the presence of microRNA 122, you can see that you get a nice increase, about a half log of viral RNA accumulation. However, when we did this in the absence of microRNA 122, you can see that while the RNA is significantly stabilized, you can notice that this curve goes down. It does not go up, suggesting that the viral RNA is just not replicating in the absence of the microRNA. So we thought, okay, what's next? So we wanted to know what else microRNA-122 might be doing. 
So then we turn to a technique that we've used in the lab to look at RNA structure. And this technique is called selective two prime hydroxyl acylation analyzed by primer extension, which is a mouthful. So we just call it shape analysis. And the shape analysis works by taking uh, shape reagents such as NAIN3. And NAIN3 can react with the two prime OH group of RNA molecules. And if the R two prime OH group is really flexible, it's sort of single stranded and it's waving around in solution, it can react with the um, NAIN3. But if it's base paired or bound by a protein, then it can't react very well with the shape reagent. And so when it reacts with the shape reagent, it forms this two prime O aduct. And this two prime O aduct acts as a stop when you do a reverse transcription reaction. And so you get stops where the RNA is sort of single stranded, but if it's double stranded, you don't get very many stops. And then what you can do is you can perform a primer extension reaction and run this out on a gel or by capillary electrophoresis. And then you can basically read off what the secondary structure is of your RNA. And so we decided to look at uh, the secondary structure of the five prime UTR of the HCV genome. And this was the prevailing model at the time. So this is the HCV iris confirmation um, right here. And what we noticed when we actually did um, um, a prediction analysis of the RNA structure at the five prime terminus of the genome, we actually noticed that this wasn't the most stable uh, RNA structure. There were actually several other confirmations of the RNA that were more stable than this um, functional confirmation. And so when we performed shape analysis, what we noticed was that that actually wasn't the structure of the RNA, at least in vitro and solution. This was actually the most um, stable confirmation. And then when microRNA-122 uh, was added to the reaction, then it actually changed the structure of the viral RNA into this confirmation, which is now much more energetically stable with the microRNA there and forms part of the HCV iris, making the RNA translationally competent. Now, we did those experiments in the presence of just microRNA-122 and the viral RNA, but we know in cells that microRNA-122, it doesn't come naked, it comes as part of an argonaut protein. So we reached out to some of our colleagues at uh, Scripps University, our Scripps Research Institute, um, and they sent us some argonaut protein loaded with microRNA-122. And we did some gel shift assays to look at if whether two microRNA-122 argonaut complexes could bind simultaneously to the HCV genome. So we could see a single shift and a double shift suggesting that even though the microRNA uh, sites are actually really close together, you can actually have two bound to the viral RNA simultaneously. And then we decided to repeat the shape analysis, this time in the presence of the argonaut protein and the microRNA-122. And so here I'm just showing you the difference in shape reactivity uh, without any of the argonaut microRNA-122 and with the argonaut microRNA-122. And we were a little bit surprised when we got this data for two reasons. So first, we saw that there was an increase in shape reactivity in this region. And this was really surprising because we know that the microRNA actually base pairs there. So we were a little bit surprised when we saw this result. And the second thing we were surprised about was that we could see um, changes in reactivity in this region of stem loop two of the viral genome. And that sort of surprised us because we thought that was sort of distant from the sites that we were looking at. And it puzzled us for a while until we decided to reach out to uh, our colleagues, Hin Harkin and Chris Gonzalez at NYU, who helped us to model these interactions with the crystal structure of Argonaut 2. So here I'm showing you a model of the crystal structure of uh, Argonaut 2 proteins on the HCV genome with microRNA-122. So the HCV genome is shown in teal or cyan, and the microRNA sites are shown in red. And what we realized was actually the two argonaut proteins are too close together physically on the viral genome to play nice. So what was happening is that the argonaut protein at site two was actually releasing the base pairing interactions it had to make accommodate the microRNA at site one on the viral genome. And that explained the change in shape reactivity that we saw in the previous slide. So when we submitted this paper um, for peer review, the reviewer said, oh, this is really cool. This is really great. But you know what would be even better? It would be even better if instead of just modeling the end of the viral genome, you also modeled the entire HCV iris with the ribosome in here. And I thought like, oh, God. <laughs> um, but Hin Hark, our collaborator, was like totally not deterred. He's like, yeah, yeah, I think I can do that. So that's what he did. 
And so here I'm showing you the two argonaut proteins, one in pink at site two and one at purple at site one. And now you're seeing the entire HCV iris here, as well as the 40S ribosomal RNA subunit. And this was really exciting because when we looked closely at the uh, model, we saw that actually this unstructured PB domain of argonaut two was sort of sticking its elbow right into the HCV iris, precisely where we saw that change in shape reactivity in stem loop two of the viral RNA. So if I take everything that I've told you so far and I put it into a model, let me tell you what our current model is for argonaut microRNA 122 interactions with the HCV genome. So we think that when the viral RNA enters the cell, it's in this conformation. So this is the five prime UTR of the viral RNA. And this is the most energetically favorable conformation. So it makes sort of a lot of sense. And in this conformation, you'll notice that site two is actually unpaired, but site one is actually in a base pairing interaction. So we think that what happens first is you get recruitment of an argonaut microRNA-122 complex to site two on the viral genome. And this acts as an RNA chaperone or ribo switch to refold the viral RNA. And this allows the viral iris to form or internal ribosomal entry site. And now the RNA is translationally competent and it can make viral proteins. And now you'll notice that the RNA has opened up. So now site one is also accessible. So we then think we get recruitment of a second argonaut microRNA 122 complex this time to site one on the viral RNA. And the microRNA at site one actually base pairs with the viral five prime terminus of the RNA. And we think this protects the RNA from pyrophosphatase activity and exoribonuclease activity, providing the virus with uh, RNA stability. Now, interestingly, the two argonaut proteins are so close together that they don't play nice, right? So the argonaut protein at site two actually releases some of its base pairing interaction in order to accommodate the argonaut protein at site one. But in doing so, it makes further contact with the HCV iris at stem loop two and between stem loops two and three. And we think that this actually helps promote translation by stabilizing the viral uh, iris. All right. So when we submit, submitted um, these papers, and every time we submit a paper on this topic from my lab, one of the reviewers always asks us the same question. He always says, which of the three roles is the most important? And so that's what we set out to test in this next part of my talk. So this is the work of Mary Lynn Rowe, who was a master's student in my lab who graduated last year. And what uh, Mary Lynn wanted to know is which of the three roles was most important. And so she devised a strategy so that we could um, isolate the three roles in the HCV life cycle. And so again, we're using uh, luciferase reporter RNA, uh, which contains a luciferase gene, so we can monitor viral RNA accumulation using light. Um, and she's using wild type RNAs, as well as RNAs which have a mutation in the active site of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So they're sort of replication dead. And then she's introducing microRNA duplexes into the cells along with these viral RNAs, um, either into HOH 7.5 cells or um, MIR122 knockout cells. And then she monitored luciferase over time. We also did this by viral RNA, but just in the um, interest of being simple, I'm just gonna show you the luciferase data today. And the way that we isolated the three roles is we used a microRNA-122 complementation system. So in wild type HOH7 cells, which are liver cells, they contain a lot of micro endogenous microRNA-122. So they can bind to both sites on the viral genome. But um, if you make a mutation in the viral RNA, now the endogenous microRNA can't bind. So we have to add in a compensatory microRNA um, in order to recoup binding at that site. We can do that at site one or site two or both. So the first thing that Mary Lynn did was she wanted to assess the overall effect of VR22 in the establishment and maintenance of HCV RNA replication. So she took viral RNAs um, and either uh, that were mutant in both sites and she either looked at them alone in HH 7.5 cells or she added uh, the compensatory microRNAs so they could bind to both sites. I'm just gonna walk you through this. So first we're looking at a GNN condition. So the GNN condition is can't replicate, but it, the viral RNA can get into, when we get, when we introduce it into cells, it can translate a little bit, but then it decays over time. So you see that it decays to background here by about 24 hours. 
Um, and if you add the microRNA, the compensatory microRNA, you see you get about a boost of about two to three fold in viral translation at those early time points. And so we use GNN for the remainder of my talk to really look at the establishment phase of the viral life cycle. And we quantified at the uh, six hour time point, the GNN condition to be the sort of the establishment phase of the viral life cycle. And then we also looked at wild type microRNA 122, uh, wild type HCV RNA. And wild type HCV RNA is replication competent, but you can see that even in the present, if it doesn't have any microRNA 122, it actually looks just like a GNN, it just decays over time. But if you add the microRNA, then you actually see that you get accumulation and replication of the viral RNA. And so we quantified for the remainder of the talk, the 72 hour time point of wild type HCV RNA. And we're gonna to refer to that as the maintenance phase of the HCV life cycle. So after a replication organelle has been established. So you can see that at the six hour time point, the effect is about two to three fold. And then at the um, 72 hour time point, it's about a 2000 fold effect of having the microRNA there. All right. So next we wanted to assess what's the contribution of the riboswitch effect. So to do this, we used a mutant that we had in the lab, which actually preferred the stem loop two confirmation over stem loop two alt. But because the HCV doesn't replicate when you don't add the microRNA, we just did this with a GNN condition or a replication defective. But of course, when we quantified the effect at the six hour time point, we didn't really see a significant difference. Um, so we thought that the riboswitch effect maybe doesn't have that much contribution to the overall effect of MIR122, but I'll return to this point a little bit later on in my talk. Next, we wanted to look at the stability effect. And we knew that stability was primarily mediated by the microRNA at site one on the viral genome. So we complemented site two, and then we uh, added a control microRNA or the microRNA that could bind to site one. And when we quantified these effects, we saw that at the six hour time point, again, it was about a two to three fold effect in the establishment phase. And in the maintenance phase, it was about a 30 fold effect on viral RNA accumulation. And finally, we wanted to look at the contribution to the translation, translation effect. Um, and we knew this was primarily needed by the microRNA at site two on the viral genome. So we complemented site one, and then we either added a control or um, the microRNA to site two. When we did this, again, we saw that the establishment phase, the effect was about two to three fold. But in the maintenance phase, we can see that there's a much larger effect now. We're seeing it about a thousand fold effect. So if I try to summarize and take everything that I've told you um, to this point in the talk together, what we saw that in the establishment phase, the riboswitch effect accounted for a small effect, but we knew that riboswitch was important because you need to riboswitch to make the internal ribosomal entry site. And so we assigned it about a 5% effect. And then we saw that stability and translation in the maintenance phase were both about two to three folds. So we kind of made them equal um, in the establishment phase of infection. Now in the maintenance phase, it looked a little bit different. So again, we assigned the riboswitch about 5%, um, but stability became less important. It was only about 30 fold. So we thought it was about a five to 10% effect. Whereas translation became the predominant role it was over a thousand fold effect, um, suggesting that in, in the maintenance phase, actually translation is the more important role. And does this make sense, right? So I think it does because if you have a single RNA, single virion that enters a cell, then in the establishment phase, that viral RNA has to translate enough and stick around enough, be stable enough to establish the first viral replication organelle, right? But once you've established a viral replication organelle, then you can pump out lots of positive strands, right? And so what becomes uh, more important is making enough viral proteins to sustain those replication organelles and to make virions whereas viral RNA stability becomes less important in the maintenance phase, right? Because you can just keep pumping out positive strand RNAs. All right. So we were a little bit surprised that the riboswitch effect didn't have a significant effect. And so we started to wonder why the virus even maintains the, the ability to riboswitch. So this is sort of the wild type situation. So this is the most energetically stable confirmation. You can probably, um, because these are both thermodynamically somewhat similar, you can probably spontaneously switch into stem loop two. But if you have the microRNA, it gets really stably um, into this confirmation. But what we started to wonder was, why not just live in this middle confirmation, right? Why actually start in this confirmation at all? 
Why not stay in this confirmation all the time? So we started to ask what happens during infection if you stabilize the stem loop two confirmation of the viral RNA? We made use of some mutations that we had in the lab um, that actually stabilized the stem loop two confirmation over the stem loop two alt confirmation. And um, Quinn Abram from my lab, who's in the audience now, he did some shape analysis to really show that these actually do stabilize the stem loop two confirmation. So each of these mutations actually prefer the stem loop two confirmation. And then Sophie, who's a former PhD student from my lab, she decided to test this. And so um, this time I'm showing you slightly different assays. And that's because when you include the luciferase gene in the viral genome, it makes the viral RNA a little bit too long to be efficiently packaged. So if we wanted to look at the whole viral life cycle, we actually had to cut out the luciferase gene. So now I'm gonna show you just wild type HCV. Um, introduced into HOH 7.5 cells. And so the readout now is gonna be RT-qPCR analysis for viral RNA accumulation and focus forming unit assays to look at infectious particle production. So the first thing that Sophie did is she looked at stabilization of stem loop two by uh, viral RNA accumulation. And what she saw when she introduced each of these uh, different mutants into cells was that there really wasn't a significant difference in viral RNA accumulation between each of these mutants. But she saw something different when she started to look at virion production. And in fact, as she successively stabilized stem loop two, she actually saw that she got fewer and fewer viral particles produced. And so this led us to this new model of um, microRNA-122 actually maybe controlling also the switch between translation and assembly. And so what happens when the viral RNA enters the cell is that it gets bound by argonaut microRNA-122. And now the viral RNA is committed to translation. And it, translate, it makes enough, translates and it makes enough viral proteins until it can establish a viral replication organelle and it can replicate its genome. And as those new genomes get spit out of the replication organelle, they form the most energetically stable confirmation. And in this confirmation, they can be routed towards virion assembly. However, if they get bound by agomir 122 they're then committed again to translation and to making viral proteins. And we think that this actually has consequences on human patients. So what we, uh, what we know about hepatitis C virus is that if you just take a hepatitis C virus outside of a patient and you put it in cell culture, it won't grow. 99.999% of times we've done that, it doesn't grow in cell culture. There's actually only one version of the virus called Japanese fulminant hepatitis one that actually grows in cell culture and we can study in the lab. And this was isolated from a patient with fulminant hepatitis, which is a very severe form of acute hepatitis C virus. And what's interesting about this genome is that it has some special features about it. So it actually is very, very good at replicating. And it actually has a G at position 28, which allows it to form this step loop to alt confirmation that I've shown you in my talk. And we think that this means that the virus is actually able to allow assembly very efficiently as well. So it's really good at replicating and it's really good at making viral particles. As it turns out, 80% of all HCV isolates, including almost every other HCV genotype, actually has an A at position 28 in the viral genome. And this means that it's actually in the stem loop two confirmation. It lives in this alternative confirmation. And we think that what this means is that they're really, really good at translating. And in fact, what we've shown recently is that um, the A at this position actually increases the affinity of MIRO22, which really further reinforces translation. So these viruses are pretty bad at replicating and they don't prioritize assembly. They sort of get lost in translation. And we think this has outcomes for viral infection. So we think that if you, um, if, uh, you get infected with hepatitis C virus, and it's really good at replicating, and it's really good at making lots of virions very quickly, then our body recognizes that there's a problem and alarm bells are going off, and we take care of that infection. However, if the viral RNA is not very good at replicating, and it's not very good at assembling viral particles, and it just gets lost in translation, we think that this might result in a chronic infection. All right. So I hope that I've told you today um, that uh, human liver specific microRNA actually facilitates HCV RNA accumulation in the liver. And MIR122 promotes riboswitch activity, genome stability, and translation. 
And then the establishment phase, stability and translation sort of are equally important and the riboswitch seems to be less important. Whereas in the maintenance phase of infection, translation becomes the predominant role, stability and riboswitch are less important. However, HCV maintains this riboswitch activity because stem loop 2 alt, that confirmation is actually required for efficient genome packaging. All right, so I have a few more slides to tell you about. So um, as I told you at the beginning of my talk, this is a really unusual microRNA target RNA interaction. And I've sort of been spending the last 10 years telling everybody that this is super unusual and super weird and non-canonical. But recently we've started to realize that maybe actually it's somewhat canonical or normal after all. So we started to wonder how does HCV escape canonical microRNA mediated RNA silencing or does it, right? So we started to think about what happens next after an argonaut protein is recruited to a target RNA. And we know what happens next is recruitment of a protein called TNRC6. And TNRC6 is the microRNA silencing effector. And so what it does is it induces deadenylation of target RNAs, it induces decapping of target RNAs, and it, it induces translational inhibition. However, HCV doesn't have a poly A tail, so it really could not care less if you recruit deadenylation enzymes. It also doesn't have a traditional cap, so it really doesn't care if you recruit decapping enzymes. But what we were left with then was translational inhibition. And in the microRNA field, there's a lot of disagreement about how TNRC6 induces translational inhibition. And this was only cleared up a few years ago by our colleague and collaborator, Ian McRae. And what he showed was that when uh, TNRC6 is recruited to an argonaut complex on a target RNA, this induces liquid-liquid phase separation into a phase separated droplet. And this droplet is important because it actually serves as a physical barrier to large molecular complexes, such as the ribosome. And so we started to think about this idea of liquid liquid phase separation. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So what is liquid liquid phase separation? Well, it's a mechanism whereby RNA and proteins can come together into a dense phase um, that's separated from uh, the rest of the cytoplasm or uh, its surrounding environment. And these are characterized by their um, rapid formation and dissolution, uh, their uh, spherical state, shape due to surface tension and their ability to fuse with other um, liquid liquid uh, phase separated droplets. And this is dependent on the number and strength of inter intermolecular interactions. And you can sort of think of this as um, vinegar droplets in an oil, uh, salad, um, oil and vinegar salad dressing. And so we started to think about what the common features were of proteins which mediate liquid-liquid phase separation in our cells. So first, uh, proteins which undergo phase separation typically have intrinsically disordered regions, and that is regions of the protein that don't have a fixed 3D structure. They're sort of um, disordered in their nature. It also usually typically is mediated by proteins which have low complexity domains. And what I mean by that is that they are enriched in certain amino acids, typically aromatic and hydro, uh, hydro, um, typically aromatic, uh, um, aromatic amino acids, but typically depleted in hydrophobic amino acids. They typically have RNA binding domains. So um, uh, phase separation proteins are enriched in RNA binding proteins and they often form dimers or higher ordered oligomers. And they're typically regulated by post-translational modifications um, and particularly phosphorylation. So when we looked at this list, we actually realized that not only does TNRC6 have some of these features, but actually there are viral proteins which have some of these features as well. So we started to wonder if actually the recruitment of argonaut microRNA 122 complexes to the HCV genome could actually solve the dilemma of positive sense RNA viruses. And the dilemma of positive sense RNA viruses is that ribosomes travel from the five prime to three prime direction. And uh, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which copies the viral RNA actually travels from the three prime to five prime direction. So you can't have these two reactions happening at once. Otherwise you'd collide and you get half an RNA and half a polyprotein and you'd be none the better for it, right? So viruses actually have to have a mechanism to turn off translation in order to be able to begin or initiate replication. 
And so we started to wonder if Miron22 helped me, helps to mediate the switch from translation to replication and helps establish replication organelles. So this is our working model that we're working towards now. So we think that when the viral RNA enters the cell, it's in this conformation, and this is the most energetically favorable conformation. And then you get recruitment of the argonaut microRNA 122 complexes, and now the RNA is riboswitched, it's stable, and it's translationally competent. And now the viral proteins can begin to accumulate, and one of these viral proteins called NS5A is involved in replication organelle biogenesis and actually has all the features I just told you about of a phase separating protein. And we know that NS5A binds to the poly UUC tract in the three prime UTR of the viral genome. We also know that it's tethered to the ER membrane through these amphipathic helices it has. And we think that what happens is that micro, our, uh, NS, the NS5A protein binds to the poly UUC tract and starts to phase separate the viral RNA at the three prime end of the viral genome. However, ribosomes are still traveling along the RNA, wiggling that RNA around. So it can't condense the whole RNA. And so we think what happens next is recruitment of the TNRC6 protein, this time to the five prime end of the viral RNA. And we think that this results in uh, five prime condensation and excludes ribosomes, allowing a liquid-liquid phase separated droplet to form. And now that ribosomes aren't traveling along the RNA, the NS5A protein is free to condense the viral RNA and because it has these amphipathic helices that tether it to the ER membrane. As it does so, it pulls the ER membrane around the viral RNA, creating the replication organelle where the virus can replicate its genome. And viral replication then occurs here and positive strands get spit out from the replication organelle. And these can then go on to seed a new replication organelle or can be routed towards viral packaging by using this stem loop to alt conformation. And we actually think that viral packaging is also mediated by phase separation in the viral life cycle. So I don't have time to go into um, our new data on this, but I wanna tell you why I think this is really important for viruses. So we started to think about what the benefits might be of phase separation or biomolecular condensation for viruses. So first it's a way for viruses to localize all their proteins and RNA to one place in a complex environment of the cytoplasm. Two, it's a way to inactivate reactions like translation in this case. It's also a way to activate reactions. So by bringing molecules and their substrates in close proximity. And it can really provide stabilization. And I think this is a really key point for RNA viruses because RNA synthesis is actually really, really hard if you think about it. It's even harder for an RNA virus in the cytoplasm. So an RNA virus has to take the very end of the viral RNA, the three prime terminus, it has to hold it with its RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And then it has to stabilize two incoming NTPs to create the first phosphodiester bond in order to initiate RNA synthesis. And this is actually really tough to do in the complex environment of the cytoplasm. So we think stabilization is really important here. We also think that these liquid-liquid phase separated bodies allow some compartmentalization. And this is true for lots of viruses. Um, coronaviruses, for example, it's thought that the inner shells are actually where replication occurs and the outer shells are where transcription and assembly of uh, nucleocapsids occurs. They can also generate force um, for budding of viral particles or to create the replication organelle. They also serve as a selective filter, letting some metabolites in and allowing some metabolites to stay out. And they can, uh, be in, can help induce protection by preventing nucleases or sensors of double-stranded RNA from getting into the viral replication organelle. And we don't think that this is unique to hepatitis C virus. We think actually all viruses are masters of biomolecular condensates. And they, they have proteins which um, help nucleate uh, these phase separated compartments and then condense the RNA into them for both um, replication of the viral RNA, but also to condense the long viral RNA into a, a virion. We think this is primarily mediated by three types of activities in viral um, genomes. And that's an anti-terminator, which is something that condenses the RNA into the viral replication organelle, a nucleocapsid, which is something that condenses the RNA into the virion, 
And these are typically regulated by a phosphoprotein. Um, and this is just an example of how different viruses, um, positive and negative sense and double strand RNA separate these roles across their proteins. Some of them have one protein that does it all, some of them have two, and some of them have three proteins which do these three roles. All right. So I hope today I've told you that um, a microRNA called microRNA-122 is really the puppet master of the hepatitis C virus life cycle. And it has at least four roles in the H3 life cycle. So it acts as an RNA chaperone or riboswitch. It provides stability to the viral RNA. It promotes translation. And then it also turns off translation, switching the RNA from translation to replication and helping to facilitate viral replication organelle biogenesis. And I think through studying this microRNA interaction, we may have uncovered a common mechanism that maybe all viruses use to establish replication organelles and to assemble nucleocapsids. So I just wanted to take one slide to just tell you a little bit about the interests, other interests of the Sagan lab. So we're really interested in uh, viral RNA and viral structure, as well as the three main components of the viral life cycle, which are translation, replication, and packaging. And we wanna understand what regions of the genome are important for mediating these different events. How are these events uh, regulated? So the switch from translation to replication, making replication organelles and making viral uh, particles. We wanna understand how this contributes to the establishment and persistence of infections. So acute versus chronic. What host and viral factors are involved and help mediate these events and how do these events occur? as well as how can we interfere with or exploit these processes, right? In order to develop antivirals. And what can this teach us about other RNA viruses or cellular RNA regulation? So uh, with that, I'll make my acknowledgements. Um, so this is my awesome research lab. Most of them moved with me from McGill to UBC uh, this summer. Um, and we're here in 4E in the LSI. I'd also like to thank some of our collaborators, um, particularly for this talk, uh, Ian McRae and Luca Gebert, Chris Gonzalez and Hinhart Gan, um, and Joyce Wilson at University of Saskatchewan. Um, and thank you for your attention. I'd be really happy to take any of your questions. I'm not your friend anymore, Conway. That was great. Thank you so much. I, I don't know where to start. Um, 122 has lots and lots of functions in the cell. Yeah. It has lots and lots of functions in an animal. Yeah. And so as soon as you started mentioning HUH7 and HUH7.5, mm -hmm. which yeah. is especially susceptible to infectivity, yeah. I started thinking about animals. Okay. Yeah. Are you? I think about animals a little bit. So um, most of the work that we do in the Sagan lab is in cell culture and hepatitis C virus doesn't infect um, any small animals. But recently some um, uh, related hepatitis viruses have been discovered in like rodents and bats and other animals. Interestingly, they all actually do have conserved microRNA-122 sites and they seem to be susceptible. I might actually have... Ah. Here we go. Um, it actually, they all have microRNA 122 sites. So they all seem to use microRNA 122 for viral RNA accumulation, particularly, um, I think this has been shown for, we showed it for GB virus B. Um, others have shown it for the equine um, hepatitis viruses. And more recently, people are looking into it in the rodents. Um, I'm not sure if the three, the three roles are important for all of these viruses, but I think probably that phase separation that the R microRNA is inducing may be important for the establishment of all of these viruses. So, so in the phase separation, what factors might lipids have? Yeah, so um, all of these positive sense RNA viruses actually induce... Um, their uh, replication organelles are actually vesicular. So they actually like pull the ER membrane either around them or they actually um, push their replication organelles into the ER membrane. So they're either sort of like 
they grow out of the ER or they push into the ER kind of thing. So certainly lipids are really important because these aren't sort of true, what you would call membraneless organelles because they are sort of vesicular in nature. But in the negative sense, RNA viruses, they are true sort of membraneless organelles. And we think the real difference is that in the positive sense, RNA viruses, they either have sort of a transmembrane domain, their phase separation proteins, or interact with something that is bending the ER membrane. And so that it's both, in both cases, I think it's liquid liquid phase separation, but one is sort of on a membrane and one one isn't. So I'm just asking you this, because I I think I remember a huge literature about MIR-122 involvement in lipid metabolism. Yeah. So certainly microRNA-122 is an, it's, it sort of um, regulates an upstream regulator of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. So for example, in the patients that were treated with the microRNA-122 inhibitors, the side effect is they all had low cholesterol, sort of a good side effect to have. Mm -hmm. um, but we think that the effects on lipid metabolism are independent from the direct genetic effect HCV has uh, with microRNA-122 because you can actually exchange microRNA-122 for a different microRNA, and then HCV is now addicted to microRNA-15 instead of microRNA-122. So you can kind of switch what microRNA the virus is um, addicted to. However, in HCV-infected patients, all of the normal targets of microRNA-122 are actually um, dysregulated. Um, and that's because HCV acts as a sponge for the, the microRNA. And so all of the um, normal targets of microRNA-122 are actually increased. Thanks a lot, Selena. Yeah. I've not monopolized enough of your time for no others worries. to collect their thoughts. <laughs> so Selena, so can people have um, deficiencies of uh, microRNA-122 or, and are there very, presumably there's variations in levels um, that have an impact on susceptibility of, or serious severity of disease? Yeah, it's a really good question. So not that I, there's, so there's not been any like SNPs that I've ever seen in the microRNA itself. It's like so super highly conserved and it's really important for liver function. So I think that um, that's probably selected against a lot. There was a study which looked at um, MIR-122 levels um, in different patients, and they, I always get it mixed up, but basically they saw that when the levels were, it they, the levels of microRNA-122 were a little bit higher in patients that didn't respond to therapy, um, but at the time it was like an interferon-based therapy, so it was a little bit more complex. So I'm not sure we can draw like too many conclusions from that, but certainly there, the levels seem to be a little bit different. The problem is that it's like so highly abundant, right? There's like 135,000 copies per cell. So whether there's like 130,000 or 140,000, like, I don't know if it matters that much. And does it have an impact on hep B? Um, so there have been a couple of studies looking at some other hepacity viruses. So I think that there is a genetic interaction with hepatitis E virus, but I haven't really paid attention too closely to that literature of late. I think there has been some proposed roles in hep B, uh, but nothing that as sort of as dramatic as we see in hep C infection. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, I was wondering how you or your collaborators are measuring the uh, liquid liquid phase separation. Yeah, good question. So we're doing it a couple ways. So we're doing in vitro. So we actually have some in vitro assays, maybe. Yeah. So what we did is we took the, the viral NS5A protein um, and we've been sort of trying to set up liquid liquid phase separation assays. They haven't worked that great um, or consistently yet for us. But what we were doing with the viral protein that we think is the phase separation protein NS5A is we sort of cut off the amphipathic helix at the bottom so that it made it more soluble. And then we put a GFP molecule into domain three of the um, of the protein, which is a place that we know is amenable to tagging. And then we expressed and purified this um, in E. coli. And when we um, incubated it um, alone, we didn't see anything, but when we added the poly-UUC tract, we started to see um, phase separated droplets. And we think that the poly-U tract might be helping to um, induce this condensation. So we're hoping to develop this a little bit further and maybe also look at some other viral proteins. Um, our colleagues had actually shown um, a similar effect both in vitro and in live cells with Argonaut and TNRC6. So we know that liquid liquid phase separation is happening um, both in vitro and in cells with at the five prime end of the genome. 
because that would be a similar phenomenon. And then we're sort of trying to develop this further uh, with the NS5A protein and maybe other viral proteins um, moving forward in our own lab. Yeah. Hi, that's a great talk. And uh, I was wondering, uh, as is like, AFC is a positive sense RNA virus, uh, like does uh, this mRNA is involved in other uh, like negative sense viruses or the or the other DNA viruses? Is that does it matter? It's yeah. So I, I think that like I guess the the slide that I put up before sort of summarizes a little bit my thoughts about it. So I think that. I think that the main thing that viruses use phase separation for is RNA synthesis. Like I kind of don't believe, and I'm happy to debate with anybody. I don't really believe that RNA synthesis happens in the cell outside of a phase separated compartment. Like we know that transcription in the nucleus is happening in a phase separated compartment. So I think that um, because RNA synthesis is so hard, I think that all viruses in order to make mRNA are using phase separation. Um, but I think, and I think that in the negative sense RNA viruses, since these are like sort of true membraneless organelles, this is a lot more well-established. I think people sort of assumed that in positive sense RNA viruses, because they're vesicular, that replication organelle biogenesis is like a completely different process. But I don't think that makes a lot of sense, right? Like why would they be completely different? I think it's just that the phase separation proteins have transmembrane domains or interact with the membrane in some way. Um, and so I think that it's pretty well established in the negative sense RNA viruses, and it's becoming more established in the positive sense RNA viruses as well. Okay, uh, so item five of your conclusions. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to work out how you can get this to disease modification, which presumably is where you'd like Get to. Yeah, so um, I can tell you um, why we sort of are, are thinking about this in terms of disease modification. And that's because one of the direct acting antivirals that is used today in the clinic to cure hepatitis C virus patients is an NS5A inhibitor. And NS5A is that viral protein which we think mediates phase separation. And no one really knows how the drug works. We know that the target binds to NS5A. It binds in the dimerization interface of the NS5A protein, but it doesn't, um, RNA binding, preventing RNA binding or preventing uh, oligomerization doesn't actually explain the activity of the drug. So our money is actually on the NS5A inhibitor that's in the clinic today is a phase separation inhibitor. And that's what we're hoping to show. And if that's true, I think that that opens up a whole new class of antivirals, which are inhibitors of viral phase separation. And that means we can provide some specificity to the type of phase separation that's happening. And so that's sort of where my money's at right now. Yeah. Um, I have a question in regards to the protease of HSV. Are there any drug um, targets there because I think that's still one of yeah. the probably uh, most important proteins. Of yeah. The so the protease, um, the viral protease NS3, um, there are drugs against the protease. Unfortunately, um, uh, resistance develops very quickly to those drugs. So they have to be used in combination. So today, mo what, so there's three direct acting antivirals that are available in HCV. There's one against the protease, one against the polymerase and one against the NS5A protein, which is that phase separation protein. So today in most patients, we're treating them with a combination of the polymerase and the NS5A inhibitor. Um, but in some cases, they also include a protease inhibitor as well, but it always has to be a cocktail approach because hep C is like one of the most mutable viruses out there. So in every patient, every day, every single single and double mutation is created. So it's really a viral quasi species. And so you can generate um, resistance very quickly if you use a single drug, but if you use a combination of drugs, you can really um, kill the virus and cure patients. Great, whoops, going on. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank that was you. fabulous. We welcome you to Vancouver and I think we can all thank you for that great talk. Yeah, thanks.